This video is brought to you by Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community with more than 19,000 courses. Right now, the first 500 people to click the link in the description can get two whole months of Skillshare for free. According to George Orwell, tea is one of the mainstays of civilization, and like many of his countrymen, Orwell had rather strong opinions on the proper method of its preparation. Realizing one day in 1946 that the cookbooks of the age gave scant information on how to make tea, he decided to remedy that deficiency and published his personal tea-making regime in the Evening Standard in January of that year. The title of the article was, fittingly, a nice cup of tea. He does this in 11 outstanding points, in which Orwell notes only two are probably without controversy. And in this video, we're going to give George's tea a go. First outstanding point is to only use tea from India or Sri Lanka. Here I have some refreshing blend combining the maltiness of Assam with crisp, clean tasting Kenyan tea and delicate notes from Ceylon. Ceylon is Sri Lanka, so. Qualification number one met. Orwell also said there's not much stimulation in cheaper teas. He further states that Chinese tea is otherwise fine, but one does not feel wiser, braver, or more optimistic after drinking it. All right, so this is the tea we're going to be using, so hopefully it will make us feel brave. Second outstanding point, make tea in a china or earthenware teapot and only in small quantities. Tea made in anything larger than a small teapot and prepared in pots of metal, excepting pewter or containing an enamel coating, in Orwell's opinion, produces poor tasting tea. Now, we didn't quite succeed in this one, but we do have a glass teapot. I figure that's probably as good. Glass doesn't have any weird taste to it. Also, this is what my local store had, rather than an earthenware one, so that's what we're going with. Third outstanding point, warm the teapot beforehand. Towards this end, Orwell recommends placing it on the hob, which was an area at the back of the stove. He found that swilling hot water in the pot to warm it produced inferior results. Unfortunately, in my office, I do not have this magical hob thing, so unfortunately, Mr. Orwell, once again, we're going to just have to heat it up the normal way, just pour a little hot water in there. All right, Magica TV. So let's heat that up. All right, and swill it around. So this is a good start. We're already doing it exactly like George tells us not to, but I don't have a hob. What are you gonna do? Now, if you're wondering why people warm the teapot before making tea, there are two primary reasons for this. One practical in some cases, and the other one concerning taste. The first one was a practical point when you were using an earthenware or old-fashioned teapot. Not really an issue today. If you poured boiling water in it right away, it could crack or break, so warming it up, that solves that problem. Like I say, not a problem today with higher quality manufacturing. As for the second reason why people often pre-warm their teapot, tea enthusiasts usually argue that it improves the flavor, particularly of black teas by keeping the boiling water hotter, longer, and thus affecting how the tea steeps. Of course, as with pretty much everything to do with tea, you'll find people arguing on every side, with, for instance, many feeling that pre-warming the teapot hurts the flavor of lighter teas. Others argue it makes no difference regardless of what type of tea it makes, and it's all just in people's heads. Others think that the cooling effect of the teapot when you pour the boiled water in actually makes the tea taste better, so, like I say, arguments from every side. All right, so let's move on to the fourth point, and that is make your tea strong. On this point, Orwell was absolutely adamant, even though at the time Britain had been rationing tea to only two ounces of loose tea per person per week. So how strong did Mr. Orwell like his tea? That would be about six heaping teaspoons worth for a one-quart pot. Obviously, how much tea people heap onto the teaspoon is going to affect this one, but roughly if you followed Orwell's advice, you'd have used up the majority of your entire week's rations on a single pot of tea. With regards to the issue, Orwell felt that one strong cup of tea is better than 20 weak ones. He also claims that each year true tea lovers almost always continue to increase the strength of their tea from what they steeped the year before. I'm not going to put my tea in just yet because we do need to address point number five, and that's that tea should steep loose. Orwell believed that any restriction on the free flow of tea leaves in the pot, even those dangling baskets under the spout, prevents the tea from infusing properly. He also notes that people shouldn't be concerned with swallowing tea leaves as one can do so in considerable quantities without ill effect. However, I will personally note that I once ate a bunch of green tea leaves and was very, very sick afterwards, so don't try that at home. All right, now also with this teapot, I, uh, I do have this thing. I know that's going to be restricting it a little bit, but I think, you know, considering the size of the teapot, that's pretty much letting them float around. So let's put six teaspoons in there. 
heaping teaspoons. Oh, I gotta pour away my old water. That's important. That'll be cold and nasty. I'm just gonna put a bucket down there. And point number six is that the water should be boiling when it hits the pot. So strongly did Orwell believe in this that he said that the kettle should be left on the stove while the water is being poured into the teapot. Obviously, if I had a stove and if I put this kettle on it, it's not going to go well for our kettle. So very quickly, I'm gonna reboil this water. Done. Okay, he also notes that on this one, contrary to popular opinion, he didn't feel it made any difference whether one poured the water just as it started to boil, or if you waited, something many a TF aficionado would argue with him about. On this one, we can actually ring in that Orwell seems to be correct given the data available, which is discussed at length in our video, why you are not supposed to drink twice boiled tea. All right, so let's pour this in. That is a lot of tea. It's spilling out of the top. All right, let's pop that lid on there. Now point number seven is to shake or stir the teapot, so I'm just gonna give it a little shake. Hopefully not get my desk too messy. This allows for further helping infuse the water with the tea. Now point number eight is to use a larger cup instead of a shallow teacup. So I got a full on mug. There we have it. His arguing on this one is that taller mugs hold a lot more tea, and this ensures that the tea stays hotter longer. His argument is that smaller teacups result in one's tea becoming half cold before one as well started on it. Now, while this brews, let me tell you about George's opinion on the milk side of things. In point number nine, he says that cream ruins the taste of tea. British tea is usually served with milk, and in the 1940s, milk was sold with the cream still at the top, so Orwell felt compelled to tell his readers to pour the cream off before adding the milk to the tea. He felt milk that is too creamy always gives tea a sickly taste. He might have felt less strongly about this one if it had the next rule. That's number 10. Pour tea first and add milk second. This is arguably the most contentious point of all here, as Orwell himself notes. For the curious, science, and yes, there have been studies done on this one, says that the milk should be added first because if you don't, the hot water causes the milk to heat unevenly, which causes the proteins in it to denature, meaning they lose their structure and clump. This does indeed change the taste. The same level of denaturing does not appear to happen when the milk is put in first and the tea second. Of course, whether this clumping affects the tea positively or negatively in an individual's opinion is totally relative. It should also be noted here that there was a time when adding the milk first was sometimes essential for quickly cooling the boiled water, again going back to the inherent problem with pouring boiling water into cold, poorly made earthenware, causing it to crack. This has long since not been a problem in all but the most delicate of chinas, but was once a consideration in where whether to add milk first or second. In fact, for a time it was something of a status symbol to be able to add milk second as it proved that your dishware was of particularly high quality. This perception was such that famed British author Evelyn Waugh noted he had a wealthy friend who used the rather obscure expression, rather milk in first, to refer to poor people. Another just as obscure variant of this, at least as far as known documented instances that have survived to today is milk in first and Indian. As far as we can find, this first appears in the 1962 A Murder of Quality by John Le Carr, and is stated again in the 2015 biography of said author, written by Adam Sisman. It would seem from the biography that Le Carr did not invent the expression and instead first heard it from students while teaching in the noted Chief Nurse of England statesman, Eton College, with the meaning seeming to be that preparing tea with milk first and using Indian leaves was rather uncouth as far as the upper class students were concerned. Whatever the case, Orwell notes that while the milk first school can bring forward some fairly strong arguments, in his opinion, their method has a fatal flaw compared to the milk second crowd. By putting the tea in first and stirring as one pours, one can exactly regulate the amount of milk, whereas one is liable to put in too much milk if one does it the other way around. This is particularly helpful when drinking some unfamiliar tea or one in which the strength isn't exactly known. It should be noted that, as alluded to, the practice of putting the milk in second may have influenced Orwell's extreme dislike of cream in adding the milk to the tea. Adding the heavy cream to milk second would have influenced the flavor even more than the milk with the cream skimmed off via the aforementioned denaturing and clumping of the fats in the milk. All right, so let's pour out our tea, shall we, and add a little milk. That is very strong tea. Nice big cup. I don't know if Orwell would approve of these little office milk things that I've got, but let's just pop that in there. I'll show you. Suppose I should have poured it slowly so I could judge the right amount of milk, but that that seems that seems pretty solid. 
Okay, moving on to point number 11, and that's do not use sweeteners. The one caveat here is if one brews tea in the Russian style, or well thought sweeteners were fine in that case. Otherwise, adding sugar is a strong no-no, which is good news because I don't like sugar. That said, Orwell recognized that he was in the minority regarding this, but felt that a sweetener disguised tea's bitter taste, which he actually relished. According to George, it would be equally reasonable to put in pepper or salt as sugar, and he questioned how you can call yourself a true tea lover if you destroy the flavor of your tea by putting sugar in it. Further, if you sweeten it, you are no longer tasting the tea, you are merely tasting the sugar. You could make a very similar drink by dissolving sugar in plain hot water. He then goes on to challenge all the tea sweetening layabouts to forego using sugar in their tea for a fortnight, noting for those who try it, it is very unlikely you will ever want to ruin your tea by sweetening it again. And speaking of George Orwell, he's certainly known for his tea, but he's better known for his writing. And if you've ever thought that you'd like to be a writer, maybe you'll write the next 1984 or something. Well, you can learn how to write better on Skillshare. There are lots of courses on how to write, from how to write a character-driven story to developing a successful writing habit. So not only will you become a better writer, but you'll actually commit to it. But it's not just writing. Skillshare is an online learning community with more than 19,000 courses. They have classes from design to business to technology and a whole lot more. So a lot of online learning platforms, they charge you by the course, which can get really pricey after a while if you like learning. But premium membership with Skillshare lets you dive into any course you want so you can learn all the writing skills or whatever you want to learn. There's loads of stuff to learn on the platform in technology. There's game design, security, data science. There's even culinary skills and language is on there. There's a lot to learn and we figure you like learning because you're watching this channel. This is why one of the reasons I think Skillshare is such a great fit and if you've ever wanted to learn something, do it on Skillshare. Learning skills is one of the most important things you can do to get ahead and Skillshare makes it super easy and super affordable. Since Skillshare are sponsoring this video, the first 500 people to click the link in the description below can get two whole months of Skillshare for free. Just go ahead and do it, you've got nothing to lose. And now for some bonus facts. Contrary to what you might think, the highest tea consumption per capita is not found in the UK. Disappointing. But rather in Turkey at 7.682 kilograms per person per year. The UK actually rings in all the way down at number 5 and has actually been on the decline of late with a 6% drop in tea sales in the last year alone in the UK. This has only continued a recent trend. On the flip side, coffee sales are rising in the UK at about the same rate as tea sales are falling annually. So I really hope you found that video interesting. And nice practical one. I'm gonna go and enjoy my tea now. It's probably cooled down a little bit. If you did like it, please do give it a thumbs up. Also, don't forget to subscribe and check out Skillshare. Link in the description below. And as always, thank you for watching. Oh, it's very strong. Very strong.